So my name is Simon Levy. I teach computer science and robotics at Washington and Lee University. And today I'm going to talk to you about Bayesian filtering for robotics. And as the slide here suggests, you'll be learning a little bit about what it takes to build the technology behind a self-driving car like Google Car or a popular quadcopter like the DJI quadcopter you see in the lower left. Okay, well, you guys already know about Bayesian uh, modeling. Why don't we ask uh, what filtering is? Well, if you think about the most common type of filter, probably a lot of us use every day, it'd be a coffee filter. So what does a coffee filter would do? What is its job? Well, if you put in things that you probably don't want to put directly into your mouth, like coffee grounds and boiling water, uh, you wait a few minutes and you have some nice, delicious uh, coffee. Okay, so basically that's the job of a filter. It's to take uh, one or more things and convert them into some form that you can actually use. Okay, so uh, for example, with robotics, the input to our filter would be a set of observations, uh, more technically sensor readings. So here's a little schematic diagram of a robot with a LIDAR unit of the kind you'd find on a self-driving car. And it's sending out some laser beams sort of trying to detect the distance from various points to the walls in the building that it's trying to navigate. Okay, so that's the input. The output is the state of the robot. That's just a way of saying things that you could talk about when you're saying uh, where the robot is and how it's, how it's oriented. So basically something like, you know, it's latitude, longitude, and the heading uh, in which it's facing. So we could specify three values um, that, that would pretty much tell us, uh, at least in a robot that's not flying around, where it is in the building. All right, so here's a version of Bayes' rule. Um, you've probably, maybe you've seen it with A's and B's. Here I'm using a more common convention in robotics and engineering where X represents the state of the robot. And some people use Y, some people use Z. I'm more familiar with the Z version. So Z represents the observation. So what is this saying? Well, it's saying that the probability of the robot being in a certain state, given the observations that it's making, um, is you know the probability that it's making those observations given that it's in that state times the probability that it's in that state divided by the probability of those observations. Um, what's interesting about um, Bayes' rule for robotics uh, is that typically what we'll do is we'll actually just ignore the divide by the probability of z, uh, in which case we're doing something called maximum likelihood estimation, right? So we'll really basically have to make a choice perhaps about, you know, something like, um, you know, where we are, what's our position. We can't just say, well, you know, we have a whole bunch of guesses. So if we want to maximize um, the kind of choice we're making in terms of what's the most probable, then, of course, um, the observation is kind of a given there. So we sort of consider the divide by z to be a constant and we can rewrite Bayes' rule in a simpler form with the divide by z put out front so that k would basically be 1 over z uh, for the mathematically inclined. Um, here's a little illustration of what that means if that sounds esoteric. If you look there's a, a robot on the left that actually has four sensor readings. Again maybe these are just uh, something like a laser beam scanning uh, its environment and it has readings that say that it's, it's very likely to be in a certain posture. That's the one on the left. The posture that you see on the right is less likely. Um, it's a little bit, the figure is a little bit strange, but it actually shows the information we want to get across about um, two different likelihoods. The um, pose, as we say, or position orientation on the right is less likely because um, you see that all the two, although the two middle sensor beams are hitting the uh, obstacle there um, correctly, the ones on the extreme left and right uh, of the robot's uh, projection is actually just sort of sticking out in space. So that's not a realistic uh, uh, realistic state for the robot to be in, giving those four observations. Okay, so if you think about, you know, instead of just having two different uh, hypotheses like that, two different postures or poses, um, if and think about a lot of them, we get something called a particle filter. Particle filters neat. A particle filter basically says, <clears throat> we just start out with a whole bunch of random, essentially random hypotheses, uh, positions and orientations at some initial starting time, call it time zero, and at each new time, t, uh, we explore the environment, we take some action so the robot maybe drives around and tries to turn around a little bit and move back and forth, uh, it explores the environment, that action causes it to be in a new state. Okay, so if it goes forward and turns a little bit, it's in a new position, in a new orientation, and that will result in some sensor readings, a new set of sensor readings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can basically say, you know, given the current sensor readings, what's the likely current state? What's the probability of x at time t given z at time t, right? So each so-called particle, each hypothesis is associated with a probability of that state 
uh, given those sensor readings. And there's a little kind of time-based map on the bottom that gets across the same thing. So that's basically the particle filter algorithm. Um, you know, you, with some, you could discard particles or hypotheses that uh, are less than some probability that are highly improbable. Maybe we want to keep the 100 most likely prop, uh, 100 most likely hypotheses. But at the end of the day, we're basically just trying to figure out what's the most likely place we are in the orientation. And here's a neat little animation I'm about to show. This will show you a lot of initial hypotheses. Okay, and as the robot moves around the environment, it's moving quite quickly here, so it gets the idea across, right? All those little red dots represent the set of hypotheses. And as you can see, as it collects more and more sensor readings, the number of possible hypotheses is drastically reduced based on the orientation and position of the robot as it moves around to the point. This is interesting. If you look in the sort of upper left and lower right there, you'll see the robot could be in maybe one of two places, right? It basically has the map in its head, in its, in its brain, and its memory, and then it eventually, by... Uh, encountering more obstacles and comparing those to the map that it's stored, it knows that it's pretty much uh, in this location uh, right over here. Okay, so that worked pretty well. And then the, the animation starts over. Okay. So, uh, sort of the state of the art on that, a term if you're interested in robotics you might have heard of, is called simultaneous localization and mapping SLAM. And the idea here, and this is just a, this is just a screenshot from a little SLAM project a student of mine did as an honors thesis a few years ago. This is a simulation on the left that we didn't actually, he actually did drive a robot around, but to get started, we just simulated the robot in a, in a little simulator. And then on the right, you're seeing a, a actual map that the SLAM algorithm produces along with the position and trajectory of the robot. And, uh, you know, you're familiar with this notation. What's, what's the idea of this little formula on the bottom? It says, well, in addition to trying to maximize uh, the likelihood of the state uh, that it's in, the robot is also trying to maximize uh, the likelihood of a particular map, right? So you can imagine this is a very, very difficult problem. In the previous example, uh, with just trying to localize the position and orientation, the robot knew the map. Um, you can imagine if, for example, the classic SLAM problem is if you send the robot into a collaboration building so that you can't rely, even if you could put something, I'll put the blueprint of the building into the robot's uh, memory, right? Um, the, by virtue of the thing being collapsed, the robot would actually um, not be able to rely on that. It would have to infer both the map and the position at the same time. It's a kind of chicken and egg problem. Uh, it's, also, it's also been, uh, in fact, that algorithm we use was, was pioneered by a group at uh, School of Mines, right? So they're, they're sending the robot into something that's, that hasn't even been mapped. So that's kind of the cutting edge of uh, of, of, of particle filtering, I think, a simultaneous localization and mapping. Okay, so particle filtering is pretty cool. I mean, you can imagine how hard that problem is. You know, you can put yourself in the robot's place. You're, you're in an unfamiliar environment. You don't have a mental map of the, of the building and you're running around and all you can do is kind of, you know, reach out and feel obstacles and try to infer both the, both the layout of the building and the, uh, your position in it. That's a very computationally intensive problem. It takes an enormous amount of memory, uh, even on a modern computer. And um, certainly that wasn't the kind of uh, memory and computing power that was available at the start of the space program in the early 1960s. So um, there was a clever fellow named Rudolf Kalman who came up with a way of interpreting Bayesian or Bayes' rule in a way that would give you the robot state, its position and orientation directly um, using very limited computational resources. What do you mean by limited? We'll take a look at this. This is a picture of um, the D-17B computer that was at the, uh, in the nose cone of a Minuteman missile. So this is roughly like the rocket science of the early 1960s. Um, and on top of that, on a piece of paper, is a flight controller that, um, the sort that you would use in, a, in an expensive drone, sort of like the one I showed in the first slide. Um, look, look at the difference in price, weight, and computing power. Okay, so the 1960 computer cost, uh, one document I said put the price at around $234,000. $1960. You can imagine how much that would be nowadays. It weighed 28 kilograms, so it was very heavy, and it had a speed of 12.8 kilohertz. That was the clock speed. Okay, that's, that's not the exact number of computations it can do per second, but it's a reasonable uh, approximation, order of magnitude approximation. Compare that to the modern flight controller, which costs all of $17. I bought one on Amazon, the one I'm showing you there on top of that piece of paper. Uh, it weighs a uh, whopping 3.5 grams, okay, so it's about as heavy as a few paper clips, and it runs at 180 megahertz, okay, so you're talking about orders of magnitude, faster speed, lighter weight, and lower cost. Um, okay, so in other words, what's available now was not available uh, when we were trying to get uh, uh, get to the moon. 
Okay, so that's that's what common filtering did. Common filtering basically got us to the moon. It did this kind of state estimation without having to run the massive computations and storage of a particle filter. So that's that's going to be the topic of the second half of the talk. Okay, so common common filtering is a rather complex model. It is indeed rocket science, um, but it's built on a very simple premise, which is that I am making an observation about my state that I'm in. Again, the observations are called Z. Okay, so the observation is equal to the state itself. In other words, it's a perfect observation in addition to some noise, and that noise can come from a variety of, of places. Uh, in, the case, in this case, that's the equation on the bottom there, right? So that noise, V sub K, just some arbitrary variable, is it's sometimes called the measurement noise. If you've ever tried to use any kind of sensor, you know that sensors are noisy and there's massive amounts of, of, of filtering, in fact, common filtering going on in your GPS, for example, to get rid of all of the indeterminacy and noise in that signal. Uh, it's even worse if, you have a, if, you're, if you're trying to fly a quadcopter and estimate its orientation or something like that. Okay, so that's the model of observation. The, the observation is equal to the actual state plus some noise. The model of the state uh, itself is interesting too. Now, you might just say that if it's a steady state, you could actually just say the current time val value of the state is equal to the previous value. Um, it's a little more—it's a little bit more subtle with common filtering, where you can also multiply the previous state by some constant. Okay, so for example, if an airplane is descending at some constant rate, um, you know, maybe its 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 current altitude is 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 95% of its altitude at the last time, at the last second, or something. In addition, there's something called process noise, which we'll see again towards the end of the discussion. Process noise is, you know, it, nobody really explains it very clearly in, in my mind, but I, I think of it as something like the inherent noise of the, of the process itself, for example, in the airplane uh, view of things that would be a little bit of turbulence, perhaps, if you've ever, we've all experienced turbulence when the airplane starts to descend. In other words, that's not a, that's not a, a property of the measurement of the altitude. It's actually, the altitude is actually kind of noisy. It's not a smooth descent. Okay, so that's the common filter model. Now, what's the problem there? Well, the problem is we would like to determine the state based on the observation. Okay, now if this, these things were all available to us, right, if the, if the, if the uh, noise were available to us, then we could simply use algebra, subtract the V sub K noise from both sides, and we would get the actual state at the current time. Well, by definition, that noise is random. It's not available to us. And this is where the, the fun begins with common filtering and where it starts to get interesting and complicated. Okay. So first of all, um, what Common realized was that we can actually think about the state in terms of a trade-off between the previous state and an observation. Okay, observation or measurement. Again, uh, measurements are Z and the uh, state is X and we put a little triangular hat over the X. You may be familiar with that notation to represent uh, estimation or approximation. So what is this saying? It's saying that there's another variable called G for gain um, and that variable basically tunes the relationship between the previous state and the observation. Uh, as usual, whenever you have a value, I always try to say, well, what, you know, the formula looks complicated, but what actually happens is what would happen if it were zero and what would happen if, if it were some, some, some positive value like one? Well, think about this, right? Okay, here's the, here's the formula again. Okay, this again is relating the current state estimation to the previous estimation plus the current observation. Well, if the gain is zero, then this just uh, algebraically turns into the current state estimation is the same as the previous state. Uh, it's not changing, okay? Meaning that um, we actually consider, really, we ignore the observation. The measurement maybe has lots of noise and it's not very valuable. It's not useful to, to use it. Um, on the other hand, if we can rely on our observation, on our measurement, we have a really good sensor, then uh, we would say set the gain to one, right? It's maximum value, it's at 100%. And again, this translates into something much simpler. It just says that the current estimation comes entirely from the current observation. So we have really good sensors. I don't really care where I was a second ago. I'm just going to determine where I am now based on my sensors, even if I sort of could estimate where I was a second ago. Okay, and as usual, with this kind of sometimes called a tuning parameter, this gain, um, it, what we're actually going to get is a trade-off between those two values. It's not always, it's more likely to be somewhere between zero and one. Okay, so then the question is, you know, how do we determine that value? Well, uh, you know, trying to think ahead a little bit, it should be somehow related to the amount of noise in our sensor. So let's look at the next equation that gives us the gain. Okay, 
and we keep introducing don't 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 worry we're introducing variables and variables but we'll eventually be able to compute all of them so what i want you to focus on now let's just focus a little bit less on that new p sub k and p sub k minus one variable look at the r variable okay you guys you know about variance of signals think about a, a, a signal that has a very very high variance that would be a very noisy signal so let's just for the time being think about everything else in there on this right side here of the equation as a constant think about a very large variance of our noise okay and again this is that measurement noise we called it v sub k right there's no subscript here because we basically presume that the the sensor has sort of a constant level of noisiness to it um, that that also can be modified but let's let's keep things simple for the time being so what does it say? It says essentially that if we had a really, really noisy sensor, right, the gain's going to be small because we're dividing something uh, divided by that same thing plus the variance. Okay, so just think about p sub k minus 1 as being a constant like 1. So this is 1 over 1 plus r. If r gets really big, right, that becomes the uh, big denominator and, and the whole thing turns to 0. Okay. Well, again, that's, you know, that's not an explanation of how we actually compute the whole thing because we're still missing this p sub k minus 1. And it turns out that basically what we can do is do something called a recursive formula for that. So if we start at some initial value, if we set the initial value of p sub k, okay, meaning at time 0, p sub 0 is 1, then we can sort of bootstrap this thing, right? And we can say I can compute the gain at the current time based on the previous uh, prediction error here, the previous P, and that's, that's actually what P stands for is prediction error. And then I can modify the, get the new prediction error based on that gain minus the previous prediction error. So if you just introduce one value initially here, the whole thing kind of gets, gets up and running uh, very nicely. Okay, and again, the intuition you want to get here is now, I think we understand all three of the variables here, right? We have a gain term that tells us how reliable is our current sensor measurement. We have a P prediction error that tells us, you know, sort of the opposite of that, like, you know, if it's not reliable, we want to uh, ignore it. And then we have this sort of constant R, that's the, uh, the, the amount of noise in the signal, right? Okay, so let's actually continue with this. Okay. So if you've been paying attention, you might have realized that um, my original model here had a value called A, which is some arbitrary scaling factor, right? And the equation, again, was that the current state is equal to some uh, coefficient A times a previous state plus a little bit of process noise. Okay, actually, so it turns out we're going to see that again. I, I left that out because it's not an essential part of the, uh, the, the explanation until now. To actually get these values here, um, we want to make a prediction. And the prediction is going to be based on the previous state, again, times that constant. That looks very much like the original model. And now, now that we have this notion of prediction error, we can also introduce that in here and say that the same thing, the current prediction error uh, is equal to the previous prediction error times the square of that A. Um, I had an, I was sort of puzzling about that myself. Why is it A squared? And a, a statistician pointed out to me because basically variance is a uh, square uh, thing square root is the uh, is the standard deviation, and there's a little bit of hand waving there. But basically, you have some kind of uh, thing that's used to scale the previous uh, state, and it's used to as the square of that is used to scale the prediction error. Okay. Now, why am I introducing this new set of equations here? Well, the point here is that we're we're very close to understanding the Bayesian nature of this process because it turns out that all that stuff we just talked about with the gain, that's going to help us in essentially what we would call our posterior probability, right? In other words, this is a process by which we are trying to predict the state of the, of the robot or whatever physical system we're modeling. And that's sort of the prior thing, right? That's like the prior probability component of Bayes' rule. And then we're going to make some observations. And based on those observations, we're going to update that prediction. Okay, so let's look at that. That's, that's the cool thing about uh, Bayesian modeling. So we just saw the prediction formula, and now we're looking at the update formula. Okay, and here again, we see, finally again, we see our gain and our noise variance. Okay, so we saw this equation already. The next two equations I've actually written in a somewhat unconventional way. I've written um, a arrow, a right, left pointing arrow to indicate that we're overwriting, we are, we are updating the current state estimation based on the 
uh, current observation. So you'll see that written with the different subscripts sometimes, or you'll see people trying to use additional annotation to indicate prior and posterior. I just, I'm a computer scientist, so I just think about setting variables and updating them rather than saying this thing is always equal to that thing. Okay, likewise, we update the, the uh, prediction error P based on that formula we saw before for the uh, using the gain. Okay, good. So there's a little note about what that left arrow means. Okay, um, I'd like to summarize things. I don't like reading off slides, but I like to have uh, slides that you can study from or, you know, sort of everything in one place. So here conveniently is the entire uh, common filter model uh, through now. This is the entire prediction and update uh, set of equations. You could actually write code for this. I've done that several times, uh, all in one nice convenient slide. Okay, so just to shift gears a little bit, here's a web page I created to explain the common filter and a set of interactive uh, tutorials. And you just uh, quickly saw the common prediction update at the top. At the bottom now, what I'm showing is that you can initialize the model with some different uh, initial noise conditions and then run it and get a nice uh, depiction of what the common filter does. Okay, so the blue signal is the original state over time. The red signal is a set of fake observations created by adding some noise. And the green signal is the reconstructed signal, the output of the common filter. Um, as you can see, it often uh, matches sometimes surprisingly close to what the original signal was. Uh, essentially, the filter, as its name suggests, has filtered out the noise. Okay. So remember, we talked before about the idea that you would have a sensor reading like a LiDAR unit. Um, in reality, uh, you may know this, you know, something like a, a self-driving car uses LiDAR, it uses cameras. Um, you know, just like us, we use our sense of touch and, and, and balance and sight and hearing to navigate around our environment. A robot needs the same kind of thing. Okay, so the robot is going to have to have uh, a way of fusing sensor readings into a single coherent um, view model of its state. Now, what's neat about this is that, you know, by the time Kalman was inventing the Kalman filter in the 1950s and used in the 1960s space program, there was already a formal mechanism in mathematics for doing this that probably a lot of you are familiar with. It's called linear algebra, right? So in linear algebra, instead of having individual numbers like X and Z, we have, we have uh, arrays or sequences of numbers and we call those vectors. And then to multiply those things together to get other vectors, we often use something called the matrix, which is kind of like a rectangular table of numbers. And pretty much if we take our common filtering equations, the prediction and update equations, and cast them in linear algebra form, we get something that implements this wonderful technique called sensor fusion. Okay, uh, there's a little bit more in there. Um, the uh, prediction uh, equation also takes into account something I mentioned that you'd see again that uh, W so K process noise. It turns out this is almost a practical matter. I've tried when I tried implementing a common filter and I didn't have this some constant Q of basically just small random numbers or small numbers. It, it, the thing just won't get off the ground. So here's actually a uh, matrix and vector form, a linear algebra form of the common filter. It looks sort of similar to the ordinary form with scalar numbers, but you could actually use this to uh, take, you know, you could have three different uh, values in each uh, z sub k and two different values in x sub k, right? So maybe, you know, think about a single measurement um, like uh, position, right? So position in a, in a quadcopter that's uh, flying outdoors, a drone, it's going to use a bunch of stuff. It's going to use GPS. It's going to use a barometer. It's going to use uh, inertial measurement of its, of, of its gyrometer and accelerometer to try to figure out where it is. And that's, that's sensor fusion. That's what gives you this incredible lock that you get now where, you, the, you know, the, the quadcopter is hovering there like frozen, frozen in space and, and, and perfectly holding position so you can get really nice quality video uh, that's all based on sensor fusion and that's 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 the common filter you know that's that's the most common application of it I think people would say engineers would say it's used for sensor fusion okay so getting towards the end here um, you probably know um, not a lot in nature is linear right so the response of our own uh, senses isn't linear right we don't respond linear linearly to pitch the relationship between pitch and frequency for sounds is linear up to about a thousand Hertz and then it becomes roughly logarithmic so the there's a subtle thing here, and this is where we get the, what's called the extended Kalman filter, the EKF, and that, that's the most common form of the Kalman filter. So engineers will typically just talk, and roboticists just, we need an EKF for this. Um, that 
essentially what that does is that replaces our linear algebra formulas with uh, nonlinear formulas. So instead of having a matrix that represents the um, transition from one state to the next, we have a state transition function. And likewise, instead of having a matrix that represents the relationship between the sensors and the state variables, or the state vector, we have a measurement function H get something that looks quite similar, although you'll notice that on the top, right, we have F and H here. We have that also in the uh, prediction. The model and the prediction use nonlinear or potentially nonlinear functions instead of matrices to transform, uh, for example, to transform the previous state into the current state and the set of uh, observations into the, um, into the, excuse me, the state into a set of observations. So uh, to explore further, I've put up some links. This is all my own work. Um, I haven't invented any of these technologies, but I've written some uh, code on GitHub that you can use, you can experiment with. Uh, some, it's in Python, most of it, so it's easy to get started with. There's some C, C++ versions if you want to implement this on a microcontroller for controlling an actual robot. And if you're really interested in the common filter, um, you know, what to me is sort of one of the great achievements of engineering. It literally is what got us to the moon. Um, I have a, a, a nice long tutorial that's interactive. You can actually test the values of these parameters and explore nonlinearity and things like that. So thank you very much for your time. I, I hope this has helped.